Om Shanti. A very good morning. Welcome to a sharing session uh, about nature. What we will share? We will share our love and respect for the nature. And we are very happy that you came and joined us because I think you know that's why you are here. But you will see that nature, Mother Earth, she really needs the healing light and love of Baba. And we are instruments that can share love and light of Baba with all living creatures and all elements of the nature. So today we would like to offer some exploration, going deeper in different aspects related to biodiversity, to land regeneration, to water conservation, to clean energy, to pure food. And then we will have also some very in interesting experiments. And we will also experience how we can serve the nature. And this all is an offer for all of you to get more engaged in this service. Because the call of the time is now. Now really the earth is crying. So this session is offered to you by three of us. <laughs> we have prepared uh, various things and we have also invited two more speakers, experienced BKs who will share their work. But uh, I will start with us. So maybe I would like to ask Tamasin to introduce yourself, please. Om Shanti. So my name is Tamison. I'm BK from Australia. And my interest in animals and nature has been since childhood. And since then, as Baba talks about the elements, I've become, felt the urgency. You know, when Baba says, can you hear the call of nature? Can you hear the call of the elements? And I feel it's very aligned with my spiritual path. Um, by background, I've been a paramedic, an anthropologist, and I, one of the things I look at as an anthropologist is the relationship between humans and nature, and humans and non-humans as well. So I'm very interested. Thank you for being here. I'm Shanti. So I'm very happy to be here uh, to offer some of the maybe research work I've been doing regarding uh, showing that uh, the vibrations of one's thoughts actually impact on the elements of matter. Baba says this all the time. And uh, I'm in a space where I can do research to try and show whether this is actually the case or not. I'm a civil engineer specializing in water resources and a lot of water is used for irrigation. So if you can use that water more efficiently, for instance, by approaches like yogic farming where you're obtaining more crop with the same resources or with less resources, then that would make a practical impact. So coming from that side, I've been doing a bit of work, a bit of research in this area, and that's one of the main things I'll be sharing in addition to other things. Om Shanti. Thank you. And my name is uh, Aneta, and I'm also happy to be here. Um, and I'm here because I feel it's my privilege and my honor to be Baba's instrument to serve the nature. For uh, 10 years, I've been serving in India One Solar Thermal Power Plant in Shantivan. And recently, I also got different chances to do service at UN platforms. And we will also speak about it a little bit later on. So now, I think I just would like to invite you to participate in this session. Open your hearts and open your minds. As uh, Sister Jayanti says, this green service is actually for us to re-emerge the sanskaras of love and respect for the nature. And we see that these sanskaras will stay with us till the end of the Kalpa. And also this service is uh, really what Baba would like us to do, to become images of support 
for human souls and for the nature. So the nature also can get purified through our pure vision and elevated actions. And then through this, others get inspired and they will ask, wow, how come you are like this? How come you can do this? And then they will also get closer to Baba. So I feel very honored and privileged to be part of this team. And uh, our program is quite packed, as you will see, because we were very enthusiastic to share many, many things. So let us see how it goes, and we are flexible to adjust. But before we start, I would like you to take just half a minute to reflect for yourself why you are here, how you would like to take benefit from this session. Because when we make objective and aim clear, then we can take more benefit, isn't it? So please just spend half a minute and think for yourself, why have you come here? I'm Shanti, thank you. We are here to serve the nature. And actually we should be outside, isn't it? Not inside. But we have some plants. This is our... <laughs> this, is, yes. this is our daddy, daddy sunflower. <laughs> daddy so. sunflower, please meet her. Very beautiful, very dignified. But okay, we are not outside, still we are here and we would like to bring some ideas or some feelings of the nature, different elements. Because not often we think how nature thinks or how water feels, how the flower feels. So now we will offer you this kind of perspective to start with. Some call me nature. Others call me mother nature. I've been here for over four and a half billion years. 22,500 times longer than you. I don't really need people, but people need me. Yes, your future depends on me. When I thrive, you thrive. When I falter, you falter. Or worse. But I've been here for eons. I have fed species greater than you, and I have starved species greater than you. My oceans. My soil, my flowing streams, my forests, they all can take you or leave you. How you choose to live each day, whether you regard or disregard me, doesn't really matter to me. One way or the other, your actions will determine your fate, not mine. I am nature. I will go on. I am prepared to evolve. Are you? Soil is asking us whether we could treat her with a little bit more respect if we want to eat. Can we? So let's listen to water. I am water. To humans, I am simply just there. I'm something they just take for granted. But there is only so much of me. And more and more of them every single day. I start as rain in the mountains, flow to the rivers and streams, and end up in the ocean. Then the cycle begins again. 
and it will take me 10,000 years to get back to the state I'm in now. But to humans, I'm just water, just there. Where will humans find me when there are billions more of them around? Where will they find themselves? Will they wage wars over me, like they do over everything else? That's always an option. But it's not the only option. And where will humans find me when there are many more billions of them? And will people wage war over me, over me, water? Thank you. And they will. The UN states that actually in the future, or even now, lack of water is one of the main reasons of wars that are started. And actually, Baba said in a Murli, Aviyakt Murli in the 80s, he said, you won't be able to get a glass of water with a gold ring. Yes. Such will be the time. Yes. And one more, flower. <laughs> okay. I am a flower. Yes, I'm beautiful. I've heard it before. And it never grows old. I'm worshipped for my looks. My scent. My looks. But here's the thing. Life starts with me. You see, I feed people. Every fruit comes from me. Every potato, me. Every kernel of corn, me. Every grain of rice, me. Me, me, me. I know, but it's true. And sometimes I feed their souls. I am their words when they have none. I say I love you without a sound. I'm sorry without a voice. I inspire the greatest of them, painters, poets, pattern makers. I've been amused to them all. But in my experience, people underestimate the power of a pretty little flower. Because their life does start with me. And it could end without me. food, she brings happiness, she, it was complex, it was hard. <laughs> um, me, 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 everything yeah, comes everything was about, me. <laughs> that's right, everything is about me. And then you take me for granted. Yeah. But your life starts with me and it can end with me, finish. Every fruit, every grain, every vegetable, yes. there's a flower, it begins with a flower in its life cycle. I don't know about you, but when I saw this for the first time, I was really very much moved. Because we never think from their perspective. And of course we cannot hear, but we can feel if we tune to the vibrations. And we will do some experiments later on also. So now we have a quiz for you. Okay, are you ready to answer some questions? So, let's see how well we know our mother nature and the current state of it. You cannot see it very well, right? I will read it out or Tamasin will read it out. Maybe you how many hear. earths? Oh, yeah, it's not so clear. No, oh. totally not. I have a mic. Oh, you, you, do, you do. Okay, I do. So the first question is, how many Earths do we have? <laughs> this is a very easy question. How many Earths, planet Earths do we have? How many? One. 
One Baba, One Planet. Okay. So the question is, how many Earths do we need to regenerate the resources we are currently using? How many Earths do we need to regenerate the resources we are using, like in one year? How many Earths do we need so whatever we use will be regenerated and also the waste will be absorbed? Three. But we have only one. How can we have three, right? Okay. Not three, but 1.8. Three, if we lived like people in Poland, for example, or maybe if everyone in the whole world would live like people in the, United, in the United States, we would need more than five planets Earth. If everyone would live like people in India, we would need 0 0.8. But we know that India is a developing country. So currently, globally, we need 1.8 Earths to regenerate the resources that we are using and to absorb the waste. So how is it possible? <laughs> how is it possible? It means we live on the credit. And who will pay this credit? Next question. How much of the world's coral reefs have been lost in the last 30 years? In the last 30 years, how many coral reefs have been lost? And coral reef is very important. I think Tamasi knows much more about it, coming from Australia, maybe. But uh, coral reefs are nursery for fish. Like 25% of all fish come from these coral reefs. So, how many have been degraded in the last 30 years? What is the percentage? What do you think? You are very pessimistic, but it's 50%, okay? 50%, which is huge anyway, and it's growing. Okay, next question. <laughs> How many plants and animals are threatened with extinction? How many species of plants and animals are threatened with extinction? 10,000, 100,000, 1 million. One million. Huge, right? And already many have been, have uh, gone extinct. And many are on the red list. Mostly due to loss of habitat. Mostly due to current agricultural processes. I just wanted to mention koalas that are famous in Australia. They're now endangered because their habitat has been destroyed for animal farming. So, yeah. Okay. How much have the population of wildlife declined in the last 50 years? You know, in our lifetime. How much of the wildlife population have declined in percentage? What do you think? 69%. Can you imagine? Just in 50 years, 69% of population of wildlife has disappeared from this earth. Again, because of whom? One species, or how you say it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, this is very interesting. What is the distribution of mammals on earth? Mammals, animals. So, there is the category of wild animals, livestock, and humans, okay? So is it A, like 45%, 35, 20, B or C? So how much wild animals in percentage do you think are there in the world today from all mammals, all mammals? How much? Including human beings, livestock. How much? Yeah, it is C. But would you say it is C? Only 4% of all mammals in the whole world are wild animals. Mostly, this is livestock. It means cows, pigs, and chicken, of course, is not a mammal, so it's not included here. If we included chicken, then there would be nothing for wild animals in terms of population. And human beings, 34%. This is measured in biomass tons of carbon, but okay. Sorry? 
It means, uh, in terms of bio it means that wild animals are really very little, right? That uh, livestock is actually taking over the animal kingdom, right? Um, I think one of the things is that unless unless we can make profit, we don't think that something is valuable in this world. So wild animals really don't make money. So they're often considered a nuisance in Australia. It's a bit like this. And their, their habitat is destroyed so we can have farms for sheep and pigs and cows to, to, feed, um, to feed people. And wild animals are getting less because of that regard, because they can't be monetized. We can't make a profit from them. Okay, last question. You know, we are facing uh, global warming, climate change. So we produce too much heat because of using fossil fuels for different things, power generation, but also we generate uh, different uh, greenhouse gases in other activities. So this heat that we human beings generate, how much of this excess heat has the ocean absorbed so far? What do you think? How much of this extra heat has ocean absorbed? 40, 70, 90%? 90%. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the state of the ocean that becomes like a hot soup? Yeah, hot bath. Yeah, hot bath. It is devastating for all life in the ocean. Okay, so these are just a few examples to see where we live and what we created out of this earth, which is our mother for the bodies. <laughs> so this is the list with different UN bodies that try to tackle all these different things from climate change point of view, biodiversity loss point of view, land degradation point of view, food security point of view. They all meet and discuss, and we participate in these discussions also. We, we come and we speak about mind and matter, confluence of two systems, about living in harmony, about uh, consciousness and climate change, about flourishing future. So, but we know where the world goes. For us, this is a platform platform to share Baba's knowledge in a relevant, very relevant way. So souls can take benefit, they can transform, and also we can serve the nature in this way. So now I, I would like to ask Tamasin to share uh, fragments from Baba's Murli, what Baba has said about serving the nature. Baba spoke last night about the tree, us as the ancestors being the roots of the tree. And he said the roots have a connection with every part of the tree, the twigs, the branches, the leaves, the flowers. And that's true with us as ancestors, but also true of the tree. The other day, Baba says, the Father gives bliss to the whole world, including the elements. Bliss means mercy. The unmatchable beauty in Satyu is reserved for you exceptionally high souls because you are the ones who have served nature and you are the ones who have been kind to nature. You have been with nature through the entire drama and now nature plays her very good part until the end. You high and rare souls are the masters of nature. You understand nature and come into positive relationship with her. As the self-sovereign ancestor souls, you are happy on seeing the games of nature. Whether nature fluctuates dramatically or shows you soft and beautiful forms, you observe both of these games and while seeing everything, you remain beyond their influence. In your kingdom of truth, 
all of the elements will constantly do and be as you wish them to do and be. But you must now make this old world new. For this, you must serve nature and all living beings now with great humility and care. The service done now frees you from having to serve for birth after birth. As a result of your living lightly and gently amongst nature now and among all other living beings, the elements and other life forms will accompany you as friends throughout time. From the golden age onwards, they will be there with you and for you in the ways that you wish them to be, when you wish them to be. This is because of your service, your humility and your kindness in the Confluence Age. Thank you, Baba. Thank you, Tamasin. So let us go to the first uh, theme we would like to discuss and explore today, which is biodiversity. Biodiversity is the variety of life on the earth. These are all different forms of life. Animals, plants, fungi, microorganisms, and they all live together in ecosystems, ecosystems that create life and sustain life. So the food we have, the water we drink, the air we breathe, the shelter we have, is all thanks to this wonderful biodiversity. So as the Brahma Kumaris, we also participate in a UN conference which is dedicated to restoring the biodiversity. Biodiversity means biological diversity. And uh, we participated in the last one in Montreal in last year, December, and our main theme was awakening a flourishing future. And uh, our message was that this awakening can happen only from inside out. That inside we have the power, we have the resources to make it happen. And uh, then what is very important is to realize all and recognize all different relationships relationship with all rights and responsibilities. And what we proposed, we proposed uh, a concept of ecosynthesis. Ecosynthesis as the holistic approach towards anything. Ecosynthesis is the way to reconnect with myself spiritually, then with others, with divine, with nature, so everything is included. We cannot take out anything from this equation. So this is ecosynthesis, a very holistic approach. And now I would like to ask uh, Sister Priyanka to come and share with us her beautiful work exactly in this area. Because during this three hours that we are spending together, we are, sp we are going to speak about the subtle way of serving the nature, but also about some physical, specific, concrete projects that Brahma Kumaris has been doing. So Priyanka, Sister Priyanka, please come. You can sit here. Okay. So Sister Priyanka has a background in uh, agriculture <laughs> and uh, she's a wonderful sister. Right now, she's, one of her activities is an outreach project to regenerate villages. So in Brahma Kumaris, we have a new concept of building, building models of golden-aged villages. So Sister Priyanka has, together with her team, has adopted one, two, few of such villages in Kach, area of Kach in Gujarat, and she has been transforming them. And she will share with us the results of her work. Om Shanti. 
and now this, we are here at different terrain we are in the mountains uh, now we want to take you to a different terrain video Kutch is the biggest district in India and which is also a driest uh, place or driest district in all over the world and which is bigger than the 125 countries in the world. It's like the uh, geographical area of this place is more but the situation is critical here like some African countries uh, so you can see uh, how uh, we can shape this spiral of erosion with some sweet spots and we can convert this spiral of erosion with our love, care, respect, our vibration, our consciousness into the spiral of abundance and we can define the golden age in one word like abundance and also one word like love. So we can see and you can tour uh, this amazing place, how the soil regenerate, how the soul regenerate and how the abundance is bring in the system. So uh, this is the story of only eight months uh, when we started working in the Kutch uh, last Febru February 10, 2022 and uh, the land is fully barren and it's not only the land but the, the souls are there going through lots of sufferings so the landscape and so the uh, animals over there. The grassland is one of the degenerated ecosystem over there and it's like hundreds and hundreds of hectare land can't feed the 10 cows. It's the big thing over there. Uh, so initially we went there for just preparing one model of food forest. 
so different eight to ten layers of forest we we want to mimic at that place um, by channelizing the energy of soil energy of water and create a fl lush flourishing uh, food forest by choosing the native species of that place uh, and to make that space a home a home for us home for insects birds and everyone so and we are homemakers over there so this is the concept of eco village generally in the world uh, the people start co-housing and uh, start building new villages with uh, their values and concepts but we went in the vil village which are existing on this beautiful planet and we are simply adding the spices which are missing in this dish we can say how to make it more delicious uh, so we just adding three values love care respect and we are based on the interconnectedness and uh, the whole thing a regeneration is impossible without the well-being and education uh, so we are there to educate and help the people how to heal themselves how to heal our landscape and ultimately how to heal the planet so let's see so this is the mission uh, the vision is creating uh, it's like a co-creating uh, the resilient abundant and value-based society or value-based communities who are living with harmony uh, with nature it's our inner nature and then outer nature and the mission is like uh, building such a sustainable communities which are uh, by educating the people how to heal their landscapes and creating the abundance and how to cope up with any uncertainty or any climatic challenges with holistic approach and the values i already mentioned ki we are based on th three values love care and respect so this is our beautiful team uh, which is engaged in kutch which, which is beautiful hearts and mind behind all these stories and uh, what we did in last one year uh, we completed one year like we uh, reached up to three villages now it's more than three now lots of more than 50 villages come to us they want to regenerate their villages with our principles we we are mainly focusing on the grasslands i already mentioned the grassland is the very vulnerable ecosystem right now but the, it's a only very resilient ecosystem on the planet is having capacity uh, in tons and tons time so we are working on grassland food forest kitchen garden for every single village uh, and for every single home we are giving some perennial nutritious vegetable uh, through the kitchen garden program and community garden is a space where all the community means it's not irrespective of age caste and gender they can come together at the place where they can grow their own vegetables spices fruits and we started first model at a small village of uh, having only 95 people over there uh, it's a really very small but huh, it's really nice to start with small village and slow and uh, small initiative and then we can uh, replicate in number of village according to the challenges and we planted a very minimal number is like 307 3, 733 plants uh, but right now i am here but the team uh, team is today also planting some trees with love so for us eco village is the harmony uh, eco village is the beautiful world we can imagine the baba used to tell us the golden age uh, key how it is based on the peace how it's based on the happiness and love so we just are uh, seeding the 
uh, sorry, we are growing the seeds or sowing the seeds of hope in every individual's mind, ki how we can co-create this place which we are sharing with others, more beautiful, and which it's already used to be that beautiful place. So we just are giving the vision of that world and the souls used to resonate with that frequency because the youths having the energy they are coming with uh, they don't used to satisfy with corporate jobs they want to serve in communities at grassroots level and th that's why our team is growing more and more with like-minded and highly resonating souls and we are creating uh, the eco for me, eco is like E-C-H-O to herd the eco of Mother Nature. Every, uh, as we herd the uh, ecos of nature, water, soil, flower. So similarly, herd each and every subtle eco with our consciousness and respond to that eco in the form of the eco village. So some impact sectors are like grassland, watershed development, because there is no water. The area having only 170 mm rainfall. So we are working on water harvesting structures over there, the soil regeneration. When we regenerate the soil, it holds seven times more water than the water flowing in the rivers. Food forest, the kitchen gardens, community gardens, wastewater management is the key principle because the daily we uh, producing the grey water and we are growing the gardens on that grey water and capacity building is very essential and the key part like for soul regeneration without that whatever you build it's then again turn into different things so these are some stories how women participate in the village going activities and how we can find the wild uh, food from the grasslands or from the forest uh, because we are unaware of their nutritional values or we uh, lost in agriculture sector in agrobiodiversity earlier we have 30 thousands of species to eat but now our plate is uh, dominant with only three species of grain and one potato so how we can make colorful plate again so that's the vision behind all these gardens and food forests and we are teaching them how we all are connected and how we can uh, build a creative spaces from we get maximum production but in the relationship with respect and love so biodiversity as we all know the all when we uh, at the plant community something happen in the nature it attracts it's like a life attracts other lives and and all this circle is connected so all these species started coming even uh, our pond means we prepare pond uh, other water bodies migratory birds visited for the first time of that village uh, after uh, creating that ponds and all other ecosystem. These are the things and how we can live together with cooperation and how it's essential. And somewhere the reason is deep rooted in our arrogance and ignorance. We are the superior or we don't need the nature. We can uh, get the food from malls and uh, people also don't know ki food uh, from where food come but uh, and f who really feed us it's not only the farmer it's a single microbe and it's a single bee and it's a single spider and everything in that link is really very essential and some shocking facts uh, we already saw in the quiz and the same facts uh, here we lost uh, almost uh, we can say 65 percent of agricultural biodiversity and much more the all other biodiversities uh, here uh, there is the possibility we lost 90 percent of reefs up to 2050 so it's really challenging and the village Bharapar where we are working their 
population is only 95 people the population of peacock is 6000 so we are enjoying daily with peacocks it's like for us the satyuga is started over there and these are the some wildflowers and this is the story earlier the grassland is fully barren and they gifted us ki whatever you want to do you have to do on this piece of land where nothing can be grown and within a one season and luckily luckily it's due to god's grace and uh, blessings of elders uh, this year we have huge rainfall and all our water st structures filled with full of water and everyone in the village challenged us you you are the small kids what you guys do and uh, from this land nothing can grow and uh, we grow this grass so sorry <laughs> not we grow but the nature flourished itself by s some simple interventions and first principle to work with nature just don't do anything just go and be there with your presence things started happen and just observe how minimal interventions can help the landscape over there for their healing so we simply added some seeds and some water structures and then it becomes like this and then it offered home for more than 22 species of butterflies within a season oh sorry uh, 10 species of butterflies 60 to 75 species of birds and more than actually 134 species of grasses revived within a one season and all over the grassland it's full of praying mantis it's one of our favorite insects and it's it, that is about the ecological restor restoration few things in agroecological intervention like a cover crop these cover crops is grown on only uh, means it's only on dew fed uh, means uh, in kutch there is nothing happens it's there in head but we put the seeds and they started growing on only dew and this is the scenario and the people in Kutch and in the villages they are mostly elder 70, 75, 80 and they planted a whole community garden over there and now they know how to stop the water, how to use the water and they used to teach their kids or other village, other village farmers ki how we can use small intervention to flourish our village and make it more self-reliant and self-sufficient so that we don't need any other things from outside the village so this is the 75 year old farmer who want to make his uh, farm as a model for all over the world people can come there and see the diversity in his uh, land so he initiated seven layers of food forest in his uh, land his baba's child he's practicing a rajoga meditation from last 40 years so we added some garden system interventions like a small piece of five to six feet we can grow more than 30 species of herbs which are essential for going beyond the senses also refresh and relish yourself so these are all the village peoples uh, where we started work at first time and thank you this is our story which is based on our love and uh, we got lots of blessings from our elders and uh, we got the beautiful team which resonate with mother nature and we can resonate with each other and uh, we are learning from mother nature daily and we are trying Ki how we can heal more betterly. Thank you. Are you enjoyed? <laughs> Too much. Thank you. Yes, it was so wonderful, very inspiring, very practical actions and beautiful combination of uh, the inner values with uh, outside results. Very beautiful. Congratulations and yes, we are with you. All our blessings and whatever help you need. Thank you. No, no. 
your talk just the right time. Thank you so much. <laughs> now I would like to share with you one more project, which is uh, about creating biodiversity. And you may have heard about it. It's called Kalp Taruch. And it's about uh, more than planting trees. It's about planting trees with love and care and then taking care of them till the end because it's not just a matter of planting the tree but then caring for it. And the idea is that for one planet, one person will plant one tree. So this is the uniqueness of this project, that actually every person should plant at least a tree. So I will share it in the form of, of a small video so you can get to know more about it and if you are interested again there is a lot of information and everyone can join this beautiful initiative so so far 30 countries have been involved more than 3,000 awareness events happened. And whatever we do, we do on the basis of our values. One person, one plant for one planet. 1.6 million people planted 1.6 million trees. I think now more, because this was updated in uh, November. And there is a special app created. You can all download this app. It's very informative and very inspiring app. And there are different languages in this app. And you can add yours if you would like to. And many dignitaries, many VIPs have been included in this campaign, including uh, Prime Minister Modi and recently me, Madam President who also planted a tree in this campaign. And of course, our seniors. So, so many activities have happened in different outreach areas to reconnect with nature, to, rele to relive in harmony with nature. all different types of colleges, schools. Planting trees is a nice door opener for any environmental activities and then spiritual follow-up. Okay, so I think that was a very quick update. And I really recommend you to look at this app. It's very beautifully made, very informative and being updated. There is also a lot of beautiful sharing from seniors and meditations. And you can register the tree that you planted. And before you plant it, it will tell you, the app will tell you what kind of tree you should plant in your area, when, how, and then how to take care of it. It's very good. And uh, the last thing in this, uh, in this section, session, I would like to speak about a project which is called the Great Green Wall. And uh, the Great Green Wall, it's not a Brahma Kumari project, it's a project of African Union and United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification. And uh, it's a project which aims at restoring ecosystem along the Sahel region in Africa. So at the south edge of Sahara region. This is a region which is one of the most, uh, one of the poorest regions in the whole world. And um, ecosystem there has been degraded a lot. And there is a lot of uh, consequences of that. Social, political, there is a lot of unrest, a lot of conflict conflicts over food and water. So now there is this beautiful project going on, which is a very challenging one, but uh, people keep their enthusiasm and they keep going on. So when we participated in uh, this UN 
CCD conferences, conferences uh, that look at how to combat desertification, we learned about this project and we really liked it. And we thought how we can support it. And the best way to support it is with our spiritual power, our love, our respect. So uh, we have created an, an initiative which is called Peace Drops for the Great Green Wall. <laughs> And the beauty of this initiative is that everyone can join. Every month we have special programs where we choose different values which are relevant to this project and we create uh, special meditations and sharings by our seniors. So you can also join and we all can send Baba's vibrations, Baba's love and power to those souls who work in this project and also to the ecosystem itself. So now I would like you to uh, see one example of this kind of meditation that we do and join us so together we can share our gratitude for the Great Green Wall. The first one is a short introduction, invitation to join the initiative. It's time to make a difference. And this is for people outside, right? For so-called logic people, as we say. So, let's join before it's too late. To inspire meaningful changes in our environment and communities, we need the right mindset. Meditation builds our inner strength to overcome all obstacles. And like water drops, its ripples span far and wide. Drops of peace. Peace drops for the great green wall. And now let's have meditation for the great green wall. And in this meditation, we focus on gratitude. Gratitude. What am I grateful for when I reflect on the great green wall? It is growing a word wonder. The Great Green Wall is taking root in Africa's Sahel region at the southern edge of the Sahara Desert, one of the poorest places on the planet. Millions of people there are already facing the devastating impact of climate change. Persistent droughts lack of food, conflicts over exhausting natural resources, and mass migration are just some of the many consequences. The Great Green Wall is about much more than growing trees. It's about improving millions of lives. It is growing fertile land, which is one of humanity's most precious natural assets. It is growing biodiversity to bring life to the degraded ecosystem. It is growing a wall of hope against poverty. It is growing food security for the millions that go hungry every day. It is growing green jobs, giving real incomes to families across the Sahel. It is growing a reason to stay, to help break the cycle of migration. What do I feel? I feel 
a lot of appreciation for those people suffering due to climate change and I am grateful for their dignity, courage and resilience. I am sending from my heart my love and my inner power to them. My heart is full of gratitude for people who are involved and committed to this wonder, who are engaged in a mosaic of initiatives, for their inspiration, perseverance and enthusiasm, for facing all obstacles, bouncing back and moving forward no matter what. I am sending my feelings of respect to them and good wishes for their continued efforts. Nature, the one that never gives up, always is ready to heal and return to harmony if we only allow her to do it. I am deeply grateful for nature's selflessness, unlimitedness and abundance. I can see the flourishing ecosystem across the Sahel region bringing health, wealth and happiness to all the people. And finally, I am grateful for myself, that I can hear the call of time, I recognize the need to act and I have the inner power and motivation to do it. I have a connection with the divine light, spreading the rays of hope and love to all living beings the land, the plants, all animals of the Sahel region. Gratitude is the greatest power to make the impossible possible, to grow the great wonder. Please join us every second Sunday of each month. We have a new program and uh, it is for all of us to become part of this great green wonder. Okay, Om Shanti. So this way we have finished the first important area, the biodiversity. And now I would like to invite Dirito and also Tamasin, and they will lead us through the next theme, which is uh, subtle agroecology, and they will explain what it means. Um, so there's a second part, I think, the beginning of the second part of our presentation. Eh? So <laughs> we are talking about subtle agroecology, and uh, maybe the first thing is to find out what is agroecology. And I know the previous presentation talked about that, you know. So it is, uh, so you know that farming or commercial farming, industrial farming has brought so much of imbalance in nature. So agroecology is like a method of one dealing with this. Eh? Where we get as holistic as we can do in order to ensure, try to ensure that uh, agriculture is much more sustainable. And the idea behind it is to then integrate other aspects that are, that are relevant. Eh? You know, there are social aspects, the aspects of the biology itself, the actual agricultural sciences, because you need to be practical. Uh, but then you also add the knowledge that uh, those who have lived in that region already had. Eh? They are growing crops for so long, they know how the uh, the conditions are, so a lot of the indigenous knowledge needs to come back 
into the process of farming, agriculture, and when all of that gets integ integrated in quite a systematic manner, then you can say we are doing agroecology. <laughs> and uh, I have this figure here, uh, but the idea is not to like go through the details of this, but just to indicate that you know there are quite a number of aspects that are that are connected with agroecology. Uh, and uh, yeah, the social aspects, the ecological aspects and all of that. But how does this connect with what Baba tells us? Because Baba says, you know, serve nature. Baba says the golden age of your pleasure. All these issues won't arise. And you know, Baba says, serve the elements. I think we heard that from the Moolies. I was actually looking for one extract where Baba was specifically talking about farming, but I missed it. So in 2009, Baba was talking about how when you give yoga, uh, even the pests, you know, uh, the crops are more resistant to pests, to diseases, they're much more healthier, but I couldn't locate it before, the pre before today's presentation. And we know that, uh, we know that uh, the Brahma Kumaris has been doing yogic farming for over 15 years now, quite a long time and especially in India, and I think there are now 2,000 or more farmers who are practicing this. And quite a few studies have been done on yogic farming, even in, uh, in India and beyond. And what is yogic farming? So organic farming is much more sustainable. But in addition to that, we are saying, let's add positive thoughts, you know. That's where the Baba's energy, the energy of meditation comes in. And what has been found out is that uh, it makes a big impact. Probably in practice, that's why we have 2,000 or more farmers actually already doing it. Eh? But in terms of uh, research, that might also help other sectors that we need to serve. Because then you know, we have to serve the whole tree. Eh? We have to serve the scientists, we have to serve the researchers and all of that. So uh, I happen to be, what, to be working in a university, so teaching and researching. So I have taken some, I've been doing some experiments to find out uh, how well does this work. Can I show practically, you know, uh, that uh, yogic farming works, that positive thoughts impact on, uh, on the growth of crops. And this particular website, I think, is one where one can find out so much about yogic farming, anyway, in India especially. So, uh, I'm based in South Africa at this university, the Witwatersrand Rand in Johannesburg, and uh, I've carried out quite a few studies on this, and I'll present one main one, and uh, I'll just mention the results of another one. So you can see these uh, carrots growing in buckets. So we set up some experiment on the roof of the building where I am based. So that's the rooftop of the building, I think the fourth floor. And you can see 100 buckets, so 10 by 10. Eh? And uh, we set this up in a manner that uh, one of the buckets, so each bucket contained eight carrots, and there are 100 buckets. So you're talking about 800 carrots, and it was arranged in this manner, which means a bucket that you've been meditated on, and a bucket that you serve as a control are next to each other. That means that uh, the experiment is nicely controlled. Eh? One, you not say that one side is hot, one side has more wind, the other side is cold, or whatever it is. All of them are together, and uh, so that's what happened. I was working with three students, and uh, this is just you know some photos of what was happening as the experiment went on. So what was happening? How was the meditation happening? Eh? So I'm based at the center in Soweto, which is down on this end, Soweto BK Center. And the university is about 15 kilometers away. So every morning after Amritvela, I used to spend another half hour meditating on 50 of the buckets, which means 400 carrots. <laughs> and uh, also 20 minutes to actually meditate on the carrots and another 10 minutes to meditate on the water that was being treated with, for the buckets that were being treated with meditation or meditated on. Eh? And uh, an illustration is what I'm showing there. It's not very clear, but uh, you can see. So the red indicates that you know you meditate on one diagonal, you sk skip another diagonal, 
meditate on the next one. So I was simply visualizing that. So this is, uh, it's uh, remote, eh? which means I was actually not there being on the rooftop of the building and doing the meditation. It was after Amritvela, I spent another half hour doing this, up to when we harvested the crops. And uh, what did you find out? So I did this for three months. Yes? Okay, my thoughts. Most of the time it was actually just, you know, uh, sitting as a soul, taking, taking a current of light from Baba and simply spreading that light to the, to the diagonal. Yes? So I just visualize, I just stand, for instance, on top, for this case, I would be just visualize this diagonal here, that I'm standing on this. Sometimes I'd actually be above it, sometimes on the side of it, but the main thing is ooh, this light, this current of light from Baba spreading to that, to that whole diagonal. That was the main thing that I was doing. Yeah? And sometimes I was having thoughts that uh, uh, let these crops or these, uh, these particular carrots uh, in, be impacted by the highest possible and purest energy that is available in the universe because that's Baba's energy the highest energy, the purest energy, the most powerful energy, and let their potential, let the potential of growth of these crops be enhanced to the highest possible extent. Eh? So those were the main kinds of thoughts that I was having. Eh? But most of the time it's just the current of light and might. Eh? The same way one gives drishti, you know, you say before you start it and give, give energy to your food. Eh? As simple as that, you know, that sort of thing. Eh? But it is forecast, eh? and I'm visualizing that I'm skipping one diagonal and going to the rest. Eh? So anyway, we went through that process and uh, we harvested uh, the carrots and what we found is that the average weight of the carrots that were meditated on was 11% higher. Statistically, it was significant. And actually, even the leaves and the shoots were about 10% higher. And uh, what we also found out is that uh, the nutrition content, most of the constituents, so we took a sample of the carrots to some accredited uh, lab for testing nutrition content. And this is what we found. We found that for most of the constituents, uh, there was a very large increase in nutrition content. It was even evident before we took the carrots to the labs. Eh? So I was showing my colleagues, you know, this sample meditated on, the other sample not meditated on, and I was finding out which one did you want to have, you know, some fruit juice, <laughs> some carrot juice on, <laughs> or which ones did you want to have. It was clear. It was very clear that these ones are much more, have much more vigor than these other ones. So anyway, this was a good experiment showing that, you know, yogic farming works, or this energy of thought works. And the interesting thing is that uh, this was well controlled. It was actually not organic farming in that sense, because we needed to control even the nutrition to each of the buckets. Eh? We are using liquid fertilizer so that you can control there. It was hydroponic, in other words. You can control the quantity of nutrition going to each of the buckets. Okay, that, one, that was one experiment. And uh, <laughs> anyway, some yogic farming resorts from India. I'm just showing these here. Actually, I find, you know, there are not so many. Lots of practical, lots of farming is happening, but uh, looking for actual, you know, research from uh, universities in India or even beyond is a bit difficult. There are some that have been done anyway, but there are not many of them. Eh? Uh, and actually, I'm thinking, you know, that's one, if anyone here would be happy to, you know, for us to work in this area, that would be very interesting because there are so many souls we can serve in this way. The more results we have, eh? there are so many souls we can serve. Eh? So anyway, practical yogic farming in India has also realized, you know, quite lots, lots of benefits, as you can see here. Uh, so the first one is talking about the percentage increase in what? In, uh, yes, the percentage increase in, in yield, eh? and biomass yield and uh, weight and all of that. Uh, so it has also been shown to be quite, uh, I mean, in practice, results have been obtained in that manner. But if you look at, uh, if you look at the vertical scale here, the percentages are quite low anyway. Yeah, just about seven, six, five. 
actually the ones that are quite significant, you know, practical could be like this, this one, and these are the three. Uh, yeah, somehow we forgot to take the sugar. Sugar content, we should also have indi indicated something. Okay, so, uh, you know, the other, the other what, other <laughs> subtle ecologists who also carry out some research, and this particular one I want to show by, okay, it's a bit of a distraction here, but it is by two, two individuals. I know one of them is a prominent researcher in the field of water. Uh, he was also a meditator, and uh, they carried out some field experiments used with okra, and uh, this, is a, this is a bit of the detail. So they had four by five meter uh, grids, so giving energy to these grids, and then the others acting as controls, and they obtained very, uh, you know, very uh, large increases in yield eh, from the two experiments they carried out, eh, which is quite high. 88%, 121% increase with different levels of uh, extent of meditation. So very int quite interesting. There are not many results, but they are there. Uh, that, you know, subtle agroecology agri is a practical thing. Eh? And the good thing is that uh, I think there's no carbon footprint. You know, the other things you are taking care of. You're saying, oh, you are doing this, you are doing that. You're using so much of it. You're either transporting your material, you're producing fertilizer, even organic farming has to be transported. But when you just think about your thoughts, eh? you're creating this impact, you're also enjoying yourself, you, you become a better individual because you're meditating. So it's like a whole package, eh? win, win in all, in all sorts of ways. Eh? So it's so powerful, it's so unlimited in a sense. And I think it simply needs to come out more into you know, into, into every field. Eh? And that's why more research on this would be very useful. Okay, just a few experiments. I have done some other shorter experiments, and this is where you simply uh, meditate on water, meditate on seeds, and then you grow them in a controlled manner to find the length of your shoot, the length of your root. These are simpler experiments. Eh? So they take about 10 days or 20 days or something. So I've carried out a number of these experiments, and what I'm showing here are some basic results. Eh? And we find that in most of them, there is an increase in the length of the shoot and the length of the root, and they are very significant. Most of them were statistically significant, to, so this is again something showing that in reality, when you apply your mind, you apply your thoughts, it makes a big impact on, uh, on, what, uh, on what happens. So I'm thinking we have been asking questions as we, we have been carrying on, but uh, if anyone else has any comment or questions, you can ask. She's asking about the cost difference comparing chemical to non-chemical. I'm just... Oh, sorry, heat. Yeah, come, because the, the translators as well need to hear. He, he, you can use this okay, okay. Hmm. Om Shanti. Om Shanti. Fantastic work. Really Thanks. important <laughs> because it needs to be scientifically proven. So congratulations. There's something that you mentioned towards the end, which I think is very important to include in this information, which is the cost difference. Because when you look at the graph of mind yield and chemical yield, how much money was spent on that chemical? Because we know, unfor uh, not unfortunately, just the way it is at the moment, everything is run by economics. So adding that uh, piece of data would really influence people's decisions as well. Well done. Uh, yes, thank you. And that's actually what one of my focus areas now is to do that. Uh, find any commercial farmers who might be interested in this. Okay, organic farmers might be easier to, you know, to <laughs> to work with because they already, you know, they have that mode of mind, uh, frame of mind. But commercial farmers could also be approached. And the idea would be, you know, how much more you can, I mean, how much more you could say profit or whatever it is. Yeah, what difference will it make in terms of your costs ultimately? And uh, one, that, that can also be modeled theoretically, uh, but uh, we can also, you know, do it out there, you know, have a, an actual field experiment and carry this out. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I think I'm done. So, Tamazin, you can carry on. <laughs> well, this is a nice opportunity now that Duritu has 
um, shown the connection between human thought and human intention and the effect on different on plants on different life forms. So what I'm going to do first actually is um, First of all, there's a, there's a, a couple of a couple of things. Um, we know about racism, and we know about sexism, because they're you know overt forms of body consciousness. But there's also something people are discussing more, called speciesism, and this is the idea that somehow humans are exceptional as a species, meaning that we can do what we like to others and to other species, non-human species. But at the same time, there's a growing awareness as more research is done on non-human animals and other species that every time they do an experiment, we find out we are more similar to other species, not less similar. So we share 50% of our DNA with the tree, for instance. The, the neural complexity of the brain of a bird mirrors the same neural complexity of the human brain. So, and also our bodies, I mean, we know that they're made of nature, but we speak about nature sometimes as out there, we want to go out to nature. But, you know, 70% of our bodies are water, and 99% of the water cells are actually empty space. So in one way you can say it looks like flesh and blood, but actually in reality it's water. And actually in a deeper reality it's empty space because most of our cells are made of empty space. So it's very interesting, all these experiments and these different inquiries into the elements, into the natural world, into other forms of life. And this is something Bubba didn't go into, but but it wasn't really relevant 100 years ago when Baba began the Yagya, but now, and also with the daddies having mostly gone in advance, I feel it, it's up to us somehow, it's up to our generation to, um, to serve through these mechanisms. And so I have this little machine, it's a very humble little machine, What it does is we connect it to plants. We have some plants here. And just as did it to explain that when we have a particular thought or intention, that does have an effect on the plant. So we haven't done, I haven't done this experiment yet, but um, we're going to do it together. So first I'm going to connect these electrodes to the plant. And what it does is it translates the electro electromagnetic energy of the plant, the photosynthesis, the life energy that is constantly going on in plants all around us all the time. It translates that into sound that we can hear. And that's very meaningful for us because we know they're alive, we know they grow, but, but normally we don't, we don't think about it. But when you can hear the ebb and the flow of their life energy, it's quite something. So I'm going to connect them to the different plants so you can hear the different sounds, and every plant is unique. And then we will do a meditation, and let's just see. Maybe nothing will be there, maybe the plant is on their own, is on their own way, but maybe it will. So, so let me try.
don't want to interrupt them, but then it's nice to hear the uniqueness of each plant. Thank you. I always say thank you because I'm like um, grabbing their leaves, so I, you know. So we'll go to this daddy flower and see what sound she makes. Daddy is in silence. So shall we now, with this beautiful daddy flower, just as we have meditation on this most beautiful flower, there is no other one like it in the entire world. This flower is completely unique and the little face of the yellow flower is looking at you all with such love. So remember Baba, the creator spirit, and sit there as little flowers yourself, little soul flowers in the forehead sitting there. And open your heart to Baba's love and project that love to this flower. And let us see how she sings.
Omushanti. <laughs> so how did you feel? What did you think? And what was it like? Yeah, isn't it? Yes, I just wanted to say that it was stunning. Um, I knew that plants gave off a kind of sound, but I had no idea that it would be so enjoyable. So de defined, really, yeah. because it's very dif distinct, isn't it? Each flower has a particular sound. Yes. Um, it's beautiful. Where did you get that equipment? And what is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's a, you can buy them online, strangely enough. Um, it, it's just, it's a small electrical device that picks up electromagnetic waves, just like everything, you know, electromagnetic energy in our bodies. You know, if I hold it, it'll make the sound of my body, because my body's living. Well, I mean, you know, it's alive because I'm in it. <laughs> but... And, and so it just, it translates those inaudible electromagnetic magnetic signals into audible waves, audio waves. And yeah, I mean, they're available and they're becoming popular because, because of this whole wave of people feeling disconnected and they're concerned about the environment, but what to do, it's so vast the problem and what can I do, people are overwhelmed and people are seeking ways to reconnect with nature through many things. Yes, it is, it is a beautiful way to reconnect with nature, to, to bring it a step closer. And, you know, I noticed the, the register of the plant when we were meditating, it went lower and it went higher. It increased the, the range of sounds were greater when we were meditating. And, you know, it's an un... This is, this is a, an unscientific experiment, but a very joyful one. And it just brings us a, that bit closer to the, this nature that is our companion through the entire drama. So I think now we take a break for 10 minutes and you can have a walk and a stretch. The food cards, should we give those? So we have, we have some little um, blessing cards for you and they're, they're quite unique and we may use them later, but Annette will give them to you. And then... Um, and then we'll come back in 10 minutes at 20 past. So just have a stretch and a break and we'll see you back here at 20 past. And then we'll do some more. Act and the final activity is a, very, is, is a very enjoyable one. So see you in 10 minutes. We'll come back now and, and do look at um, looking at diet, actually. Diet and food, which is a big part of our lives. So we thought it's a good idea to look at, at food, because every day we have Brahma Bhojan, agriculture is, every industry has to change because of climate change and resources. Agriculture is a big one and there's a lot of pressure because people are used to eating what they eat, they don't necessarily want to change, but the, the pressure is that we all have to change. So we're just going to look at some of our food systems and the impact that those food systems have on the planet in terms of resources, in terms of land clearing. And, you know, we lead very uh, low impact lives, generally speaking, BKs. But nevertheless, it's good to think about what we eat, how we eat and 
if we can just to realise that everything we do has an impact and, you know, what can we do? How can we continue to live according to our Brahmin principles in a way that is supportive to nature? I'm sorry, I almost forgot. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm a banana. <laughs> so, let's begin with this. Re read your, your card. I'm going to read mine. And then, let's just do a one-minute meditation. And you can... I won't do mine on the banana, but you can adapt and adjust to what you are. You know, we're very creative here, so it's an opportunity to be a fruit or a vegetable. So mine is, you are incognito, gentle, and softly spoken. Like the banana, your hidden softness and gentle ways brings comfort to many. So whether you're a potato, a cauliflower, an apple, just feel the appreciation of being that for a moment. can also add the banana has a good skin so is not so easily influenced and is highly nutritious so can give benefit to many you know we can really churn about these simple things that we s so um, so should we go on to the next slide so this is a big slide <laughs> we have two big slides actually but it's, it's interesting to understand the, the broad effect that our food systems have. It literally affects every, every single system in our environment. Land use, water, forest clearing, pollu air pollution, transport, packaging, plastic, it's all involved. Livestock, I think we know, is the world's largest user of land resources. 80% of the world's agricultural land goes to feed animals who are then killed for either their meat, their milk, their eggs, their flesh, their fur, their feathers. And if we, if we look here, I mean, we eat, well, I was going to say we eat a plant-based diet, but actually, um, to not go into it too much, but we have a vegetarian diet without eggs, a lacto-vegetarian diet according to our tradition. But the world has changed a lot in the last 100 years since Baba's time, and a lot of Brahmins are now just choosing not to have any animal products. For ethical reasons, for health reasons, also for environmental reasons. And we can see here, all the vegetables are down here. And then as we start getting to the greater resources and greater impact on the environment, we reach eggs and then fish, then the meat of birds, the meat of pigs, and then the milk of animals. It, you know, it's essentially the, the nursing fluid of a cow for their, for their young or another species for their young. And then we get up into beef, cow meat, cheese is even worse than that. And then of course we have um, the flesh of the animal above that. So, I mean, it's a funny thing. We know, we know this world is not gonna remain as it is. We do know that. But we are also, we live in nature for 5,000 years. We interact 
with the natural world. Soul, souls, God and matter, that wonderful book that Jagdish Bhai wrote. And we think about souls and God, but sometimes we forget about matter. And it's, you know, now is our life to create a loving relationship with the natural world and, and with other species. So here, here we see the impact of different diets. And this is a very good site, actually. I don't know if you can see, but it's ca called um, our, ourworldindata.org. And it, it has a lot of good information drawn from scientific um, and government studies. So you can see the, the, the lowest impact diet is the vegan diet. That's, it just means a diet without any animal products. No red meat, dairy or poultry, people having eggs and fish, okay, it is a bit more. Those having um, no red meat or dairy, it's also a great improvement. But the, when, we, when we get up to vegetarian diets, even um, those that include milk, then we're seeing a greater impact. And up here we see um, that out of all our cropland and pasture, this huge one up the top, which is um, 2.89 billion hectares, almost 3 billion hectares, and yet 740 mega hectares only are used for human food. And you think about the people who are starving. And we're not going to stop Kaliug being Kaliug, but it's like Jantabin said the other day, it's um, we can reduce the suffering now by how we live because everything we do has an impact on everything else. We all breathe the same air, walk on the same earth, use the same water. We won't stop the demise of Kaliu, but we create very good sanskaras. We create great love for our fellow human souls, also our non-human kin, our non-human sisters and brothers, and the way we engage with plants and the environment in, in relationship of love as opposed to a relationship of what they can do for us. And so the just to note that um, cropland, the human food there, such a tiny amount. And then 538 mega hectares for animal feed and all the rest is part pasture where we graze animals who are then killed for their meat or their milk or their skin. So this is the something to consider. And yeah. And this is a very good picture of some fruit and vegetables. <laughs> um, Shanti. So this is uh, some food for your mind. And uh, this is just touching the surface. But uh, it's an invitation for all of us to become more co conscious in our daily choices. We already have changed so much, but there may be some more changes that we can introduce to our lives so we would live in a non-violent way and so-called sustainable way for the planet. It's still possible. And I, I, should have, I should have said before, actually, but I've worked in the animal protection field for a number of years. I became an animal activist and then I worked in politics and I've been into the slaughterhouses, and I, I know a lot now about this because I really wanted to inform myself. Um, I won't go into details about any anything bad, um, but if, you, if you'd like to know more about moving to a plant-based diet or becoming vegan, then I can do a separate session that's just information and to share what I have come to learn. If you want to, just come up and see me, see me afterwards and then maybe... I can do a separate session. Yes, thank you. The whole session is like that because we are not able to say any, everything what we would like to. So this is just invitation for those of you who are interested to, to come and we can explore more together. Yes, thank you. So in this way, uh, we'll move to the next uh, 
sphere and now let us look at water and how we can serve water. And for this I would like to invite our brother Chandresh, please come. Brother Chandresh is now looking after yogic farming in Tapovan. And he has invited us <laughs> to visit Tapovan. So there will be a tour visit organized on the 9th of March and everyone is welcome. We will then have very extensive information and we will see how yogic farming is being done in different locations down the mountain. So brother Chandresh is also looking after the training center for farmers coming from all over India to learn about not only yogic farming but also natural farming. Actually, those two things we combine. It's something else than organic farming. We speak and we share knowledge and we practice natural farming and yogic farming. If you want to learn more about it, please come on the 9th. But today, Chandresh Bai is here to uh, introduce uh, a new campaign, new project, which has been inaugurated uh, recently and it's about uh, conserving, protecting water. In Hindi it's called uh, Jal Jana Biyan, which means uh, water conservation education campaign. And he will tell us what this campaign is about, but what is even more interesting, how we are going to make it happen in a practical way, on the subtle level and on the physical level. And in this way it really will become a very good best practice that again we can share not only in India but throughout the whole world. And again it's a way to introduce, to introduce in a relevant way Baba's message to everyone. So Chandrish Bhai, please. This is a new campaign launched by Yagya and it is called Jan Jal Abhyan. In this campaign, we will try to educate the users how to, uh, how can we, how we can preserve water, what are the best practical uh, ways to conserve water, what strategies should we make and along with that we are we will try to make more than 5000 water bodies and more than 10000 awareness programs are going to conduct and the almost the beneficiaries are going to be more than 1 crore people we are trying to reach at least one crore people to educate what are the possibilities to uh, how we can conserve water, what are the different ways and how we can conserve water. Uh, this is Indian government's project. It's called Unnat Bharat Abhiyan. In this project, they are covering organic farming, renewable energy, water management and all other activities by which we can make a rural India a better India. So in this segment the water management part is there and we are going to focus on water management in this with the help of government of India we are going to uh, take this segment. Generally uh, this major areas of interventions are education, health, all part they are taking but they are covering this with the holistic perception and there where the Brahma Kumari's roles come. In this there is a national steering committee uh, to operate the whole project 
and the chairman of this national steering committee is a dr vijay bhatkar ji uh, he is the one he is the person who invented a supercomputer in india he was the uh, director for iit delhi and um, he is a very great person he is in touch with uh, baba's uh, family from last 26 years and he met baba also and his vision and he thinks that uh, such kind of projects can be executed with the organization like brahma kumaris and if brahma kumaris can be a part of this project this is going to be a great uh, initiative and in this project the local district administrative office and the panchayat raj institutions and the voluntary organization like us are together three of them together they are going to work so uh, they are working on many segments but we will focus on water in this uh, campaign we know the requirement of water and how the water is used for humans for agriculture for industrial use and animals and forest use but we come to know that 89% of the water consumption is in the field of agriculture and the water wastage is in the field of agriculture so we have to literate the farmers we have to more focus on the rural part of the india if we want to conserve water we have to focus on the major we have to focus on the rural part so okay i don't think the slide is lights i shall describe i'm not getting ha uh, yeah it's how the water is used in the human uses in the agriculture uses and in the industrial use uh, when we see it is 89% of the water is used in the agriculture 5% are used for the human uses and 6% is in the industrial use and the forest use so if we have to make this campaign a successful campaign we have to focus on the rural part where it covers almost 92% of the water consumption goes so this is why we are focusing on the village development this is the picture of where our what are the water sources we have 97% of the water is in the ocean 2.2% is in the form of ice only 0.7% is available in the ground water and surface water available is only 0.1% the total water available with us the surface water is only 0.1% so we have to focus on ground water and surface water how exactly we are going to do this campaign is we are going to connect with the unnat bharat abhiyan they have connected more than 8000 higher educations in india and these higher education institutes along with their students they are going to make the survey of the village particular village we are going to select some villages and this with the help of the students we are going to have a survey of that village we will make the all satellite 
regions of that village and what are the resources available in that village means what are the wells what are the bore wells ponds river canal non functional pipe water what are the what exactly the situation is there in that village what is the water quality in that village what are the water pollutions and then we will focus on rainwater harvesting structures what are the possible ways of rainwater harvesting this is one of the possible structures we said crescent moon structure it is very easy to build but creates a very good impact uh, 2000 liters of water can be stored in this structures in the grassland also we can make such kind of structures with the help of this satellite designs we can identify what exactly the where are the water bodies what exactly we have in that village there are some dry land strategies where we can use the drip irrigation the sprinklers the vertical mulching the agroforestry how water can be get conserved by using this strategies when we use a drip irrigation almost 80% of the water can be saved instead of a flood irrigation yeah one more i want to add one thing we have one initiative like ola system you might be heard uh, which is Uh, which is a effective irrigation method uh, where people can use the pots uh, and in the uh, areas where is the low rainfall the people use some pot and pitcher uh, thing to irrigate their orchards and uh, we started this initiative here in Rajasthan and uh, in Gujarat and which is having more uh, water using capacity than the drip irrigation water use efficiency like more than 80% so this is the good things and these are the dry land strategies which help the farmers beyond the water in the ponds water we we have this myth we we need water in the storage like uh, uh, ponds big big dams but what uh, the nature of water is to flow and we have to give them channel means different different ways in our land and then it leave the land or each and every drop of uh, rainfall should be there where it uh, drops like that there are some uh, these are some designs of grassland water harvesting strategies there are various possible ways continuous contour trenches percolation tanks boundary trenches swells these are the structures which can easily made with the help of jcb or some uh, such uh, equipments so with the help of government and with some ngos we can execute such things for individual users a rooftop rainwater harvesting is the best practice if individual uh, individuals do this it is a good way of rainwater harvesting we have one village in kutch called kanakpur where all the households have this facility at their uh, home and they are harvesting a very good amount of water and using throughout the year they are using it as a uh, 
purified water so this is what exactly uh, what are the possibilities of uh, rainwater harvesting and other other strategies for water harvesting so if this is a uh, just a beginning and with the help of government of india some ngos some higher education institutes and with the volunteers of brahma kumaris we can make the things possible om shanti Chandrish bhai thank you very much it was very good and your enthusiasm is contagious you know he not only is involved in yogic farming uh, but now also this big water campaign and it's really wonderful and uh, again whatever we can help we are we really willing to to be part of that and help in that thank you very much thank you so water So what is the biggest uh, body of water? <laughs> This is very easy question. Our ocean and it's one ocean, not three four oceans. It's just one global wonderful ocean. So I would like us to finish this session on o- on water with serving an ocean. Okay? So we'll have a meditation. For translation I will try to give some also commentary. This meditation was prepared for UN Ocean Conference which happened in Portugal last year so this is a new way uh, in which uh, the Brahma Kumaris is getting engaged in this uh, UN service nature service outreach programs just another opportunity for a wonderful service of uh, Baba I take a moment to reflect on the state of the vast ocean. Its health and ability to sustain life are threatened by humans who overexploit it and poison it. the unlimited generous eternal ocean is sick now with the eye of my mind i look with deep concern and appreciation at this great wonder that shaped the whole planet every stream every cloud every raindrop comes back to it i imagine i smell the ocean air i hear the rush of wind across the water i listen to the surges of the ocean as the waves roll and then break into sparkling surf nearby i dive into the ocean below the surface to the underwater world the kingdom of fish animals and exotic plants ocean nourishes everything gently i take in the beauty and the richness of the life below the water ahead of me 
I see a vision of light from high above the rays of sun are touching the ocean bed I've reached the place deep down the space of absolute silence and complete stillness I become calm and centered it's as if I've merged into the ocean of peace I enjoy the tranquility of the ocean of peace I'm sending my gratitude respect and love to the ocean and its life and now I focus on the light I follow the light up my consciousness is rising opening and becoming unlimited the energy of the ocean responds moves up gets uplifted too the light from above purifies the water particles transforms and renews the ocean the end is the beginning and the cycle continues the ocean returns to its purity abundance and harmony and I return to the activities of the surface I am rested refreshed and empowered to make a change to care for the wonder of the ocean Shanti. So from the ocean to the sun. <laughs> we are very fast today in our journey through and with different elements. This is just an invitation for you, actually, if you have not been to come to India One Solar Thermal Power Plant, which is in Shantivan, and see how we can use clean, renewable and safe energy for our life. Down there, there is research and development project which demonstrates that it's possible to use the energy from the sun for 24-hour operation. It's very unique. And it is possible because the intention was to bring benefit to nature, not to make money. It was not short-term benefit, but it was a long-term vision of Baba himself and our Daddy Janki. And then many instruments came and made it happen with Baba's guidance and the faith of Daddy in all of us. So now I will just show you a short film and uh, yes, we extend 
the invitation for all of you to come and see by yourself and experience the wonder of sun. So we zoom in to Shantivan. And this is India One solar power plant. which is located in this beautiful area of Aravali mountains, the most beautiful scenery we could have imagined. It's a quite big area. And there you can see all these reflectors, 770 big reflectors. One reflector is like 60 square meters, which is a good size of a flat in Poland. It's just one and we have 770. But the uniqueness of this power plant is the storage. Storing renewable energy is the biggest challenge in this field. And uh, Baba's children in cooperation with scientists and engineers developed a way to store energy so we can produce electricity from the sun for 24 hours a day. And these uh, reflectors are like sunflowers. They follow the sun, just like we follow Baba, they, ref they follow the sun. And then they accumulate the power from the sun via concentrating the rays of sun into one static point in the receiver, which is in front of the reflector. So this technology actually is the technology of Baba. I, the soul, follow the sun of knowledge, I take power, I change myself and I share with others. This is exactly how this power plant works. The solar reflector is focusing on the sun, the sunlight that comes is concentrated in one point to generate power and then this power is transforming water into steam and then into electricity and it's been shared with so many people, 25,000 at least, and then with the whole world, because we share this technology with anyone. This is one of our flagship projects in all those different UN conferences. Wherever we go, we speak about it, and then people ask, wow, but how it's possible? And then we can explain how and who is behind it. <laughs> Everything was developed, designed, fabricated, installed, erected by Brahmins in cooperation with indigenous peoples, you know, local people from that area. So there was also a lot of capacity building, a lot of uh, health campaign, which was accompanying the whole technical side of the project. And this is how the electricity goes to Shantivan and Van Mohinivan, 24 hours a day. India One Solar Thermal Power Plant and you are all very much welcome.